Nancy Murphy is a professor of Christian philosophy at Fuller Theological Seminary. She's also immersed in the scientific literature on neuroscience and biology. Made Steve Paulson wonder just what a modern theologian, at least Nancy Murphy, thinks about all this soul talk. For centuries, the soul has been one of the core ideas of certain religious traditions, and it would seem to be very remote from the empirical world of science. Do you think science has anything useful to say about the soul? Yes, that there isn't one. (laughs) (laughs) End of discussion. (laughs) Well, intended to be a provocative beginning of discussion because the issues are much more subtle than that. The thesis that I put forward is that the idea of a soul comes not from Hebrew or Christian revelation, but actually has origins in a number of other religions, but primarily in Greek philosophy. Plato, one of the primary sources, believed that the soul is not only immortal, but that it's eternal, that is, it pre-exists the body. The interesting thing is, long before people got worried about the consequences of either neuroscience or evolutionary biology, biblical scholars had already raised the question of whether body-soul dualism actually shows up in the scriptures or not. And there's an almost complete consensus that the Hebrew scriptures, what we Christians call the Old Testament, does not teach body-soul dualism. The word that has been translated most often as soul in the older versions, such as the King James Version, the Hebrew word in most cases is nephesh. And that's a word that can take on multiple meanings, all the way from being used to designate the throat By association, it designates the breath that flows through the throat. And then when people die, they expire, they breathe their last. And so nephesh is associated with being a living being. So it sounds like you want to get away from this this dualism. Absolutely. That that especially came down from Descartes. That, That just doesn't make sense. And also what came down from Plato. I think that was an intrusion into Christian theology the whole of Western Christianity would have been better off had that not happened. And the reason I say that is, to put it rather bluntly, if Christians had not thought all of these centuries that there was such a thing as souls to save, they would have had to find something different to do. And maybe what they would have found themselves doing is, for instance, taking some of Jesus' teachings about living in this world more seriously. This is quite a, a radical critique here, isn't it? Yes, of, it is. Of, of traditional Christianity. Yes, it is. You're really suggesting that uh, the history of, not only of Christianity, but the history of the West could have been very different without this dualistic split between body and soul. Absolutely. And we're still seeing extremely negative effects of body-soul dualism in contemporary politics. If you believe that the end is going to be a matter of gathering souls off to heaven, as opposed to the kingdom of God being fully established on earth, you're going to have much less concern with politics, with feeding the poor, with peace, with the environment. So what about the soul itself, that word? Does does that word have resonance for you? I mean, more than as a historian, but as a, as a believer yourself? I mean, is, is this a concept that we should hang on to? No, it's not. But you must think that there's more to us than just the brain, I'm presuming. Well, I call myself a non-reductive physicalist. And the physicalist signals that in terms of what stuff we're made of, we're made of of no different stuff than anything else in the physical world. But the non-reductive part signals that we're not just rocks, we're not just animals, we're not even just smart animals. We've got the capacity for morality, We've got the capacity for much more subtle emotional responses. We've got the capacity for higher level reasoning, including symbolic reasoning. And most important, we've got the capacity to understand what the concept God means, and we've got the capacity to relate to God. So all of that, with perhaps the exception of the last thing you were talking about, our capacity to relate to God, is is very consistent with with modern science, with, That's right. with neuroscience. There is this very concerted effort among scientists to try to figure out which parts of the brain seem to govern religious experience. Does that have any bearing on what we're talking about? Well, if you're a physicalist, then 
It goes without saying that any experience that a human being has is going along with something going on in the brain. And if you thought that religious experience was just one sharply restricted type of experience, for instance, mystical awareness, then it would make sense to think that there might be some particular brain region or regions that are responsible for that and solely responsible for that. But I have a much broader concept of religious experience. I'm not a mystic, and so I'm much more interested in what you might call more ordinary types of religious experiences. And so I think, for instance, that when I'm in church on Sunday and we sing a hymn about God's concern for the poor and I get choked up over that and my eyes tear up, I think that's a good old down-home instance of a religious experience. And there's no specifically localizable brain region that's doing that. I mean, it's happening in my eyes, and it's happening in my chest and my throat. When I feel those emotions, it's much more a whole body experience. So one last question, life after death. You've banished the soul from Mm -hmm. uh, our vocabulary. How should we talk about the being that presumably exists in Christian thinking after the physical body dies. What, what, what is that that is still existing? There are two ways to go. Either you can say simply that we are dead until the general resurrection, when we'll be raised up together. And that's not, by the way, a resuscitated corpse, but rather it's a body composed of some sort of transformed or recreated stuff. What that doesn't answer is, what about between when I die and the end of the world, whenever that's going to be? So one way to go is to say that I'm just plain dead, like an animal would be. But another way to go is to say that we can't put resurrection on an earthly timeline, because after all, time is a part of the creation of the physical world. And if we are resurrected to be with God, then we are somehow transcending the physical world, and it's not clear that earthly timelines apply. So one way of putting it, and I always stress that this is putting it in almost nonsense language, maybe each of us is resurrected elsewhere, else when, at the moment of our deaths, and so there isn't any time lag between my death and my resurrection. Nancy Murphy talking with Steve Paulson. Murphy teaches Christian philosophy at Fuller Theological Seminary.